Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Did You Know Central Florida. My name is Travis Puterbaugh, and I'm the curator of collections here at the Orange County Regional History Center. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, joining us here in person. Thank you for coming. And also everyone joining us in the live webinar. We'll make sure to leave some time at the end for questions. And for those joining online, feel free to leave questions and comments in the chat. And our host, Cheyenne, will uh, relay those to us. A little about, yes, thank you. Ah, OK. Better? All right, great. A little about today's program on Central Florida. Members of our collections department who will be presenting today chose topics relating to this region that they found interesting and wanted to learn more about. We hope that you find them interesting as well. There are thousands of stories to tell, and here are but seven of them. One of our team members couldn't join us today, so I'll, present, I'll be presenting on two topics. And I just wanted you to know up front that it's not because I'm greedy and I wanted to take up more time. <laughs> also, we have uh, school children visiting the museum today. So if there's an interruption or a ruckus, uh, you'll understand why. So I'd like to begin our program by talking about a special place called the Wonder House. In the days long before Disney, SeaWorld, or Universal, there was Wonder House, which was a do-it-yourself project turned popular tourist attraction. Located in Bartow, in my native Polk County, the Wonder House was built in the 1920s by a man named Conrad Shuck. Shuck was a poet and a successful contractor from Pennsylvania, and he worked on laying the foundation of many of the uh, important buildings in downtown Pittsburgh. Unfortunately, in 1924, at the age of 47, uh, he was diagnosed with a heart condition, and doctors gave him less than a year to live. They suggested that he move to a warmer climate in order to ease his symptoms and to potentially extend his life, at least by a year or so. He quickly relocated with his wife and nine children to Bartow. Not long after, he, he bought an empty 14-acre lot across the street and decided to embark on a project with his sons in an attempt to distract himself from this condition and his uh, dire prognosis. He aimed to build a house that was made completely of locally sourced materials, particularly ones he could find on his land, and he just about succeeded. Rocks and dirt were collected from the north side of the property and covered with concrete to construct the walls and the foundation of the home. The structure was reinforced with steel rails that he purchased uh, from a local railroad company. The only imported materials that he used were tiles that he broke and then set himself on the porches. Fifteen years later, Shuck had exceeded his doctor's expectations and construction on the Wonder House was ongoing. The unconventional construction methods, which included not drawing up blueprints until 11 years after the construction actually began, and the unique nature of the house began to draw a crowd, local residents, sometimes referring to it as the crazy house or the house of a thousand gadgets. Curious neighbors would walk and stop by, watching construction and hope to catch a glimpse of what the activity was going on inside. They deemed any person who was building such a structure to be crazy. Chuck saw an opportunity and opened his house to tours. The house became a popular tourist attraction for over two decades, offering regular tours of varying depths and lengths. One tour cost a nickel and included a tour of the outside grounds. Another tour cost a quarter and included a tour of the interior of the house in addition to the grounds. The house was not furnished because Shuck and his family didn't actually live there. Instead, it was filled with a collection of oddities, including specimens in jars, pickled snakes, human fingers, taxidermy, and even a coffin that sat in the entryway. Now, aside from the peculiar construction and its display of curiosities, what was it that made the Wonder House so intriguing? It was not only visually appealing, as you can see, it also housed one-of-a-kind gadgets straight from the mine of Conrad. Shuck wasn't simply a contractor. Uh, he was also an inventor. 
having been credited with inventing the first continuous process of manufacturing concrete blocks. He put his skills to work at the Wonder House, creating several unique features within it. The house is actually 10,000 square feet and covered in mosaic tiles. The home has four floors and 20 rooms, with at least four doors uh, adorned with crystal doorknobs. Each of these 20 rooms has two porches, which allowed for a cross breeze through the entire structure, providing cooling before there was a, such a thing called air conditioning, or the availability of air conditioning, I should say. Air cooling was also provided by hollow, hollow columns on the balconies that collected rainwater, which traveled through the house. On the porches were sunken bathtubs, which uh, Shuck had said were big enough for a man to splash until his heart's content, without flooding the rest of the house. Shuck had an affinity for bathtubs, and he devised a series of mirrors which allowed someone to see who was at the front door without actually having to leave from the third floor. Speaking of mirrors, Shuck was experimenting with solar heating system uh, that utilized, or utilized a mirror at the top of the chimney, which directed light through a prism and projected different colors throughout a room three floors below. This particular experiment, however, got Shuck in a bit of a trouble in the 1940s at the height of World War II. His neighbors became suspicious that he was using this system as a signaling device uh, for the Germans, as Shuck actually had some German heritage. Locals were so concerned, in fact, that they notified the FBI, and he was subsequently arrested and jailed for several days. Um, ironically, Shuck had a son in the Air Force and a son-in-law who worked for the FBI, uh, so he was released and found not to be a spy. Um, other notable features of the house include a pool, which some called a moat, two concrete bridges, removable ceiling tiles for ease of redecorating, holes in the front step railings for planters, hollow columns that allowed rainwater to collect and be used for plant watering, uh, a laundry chute with branches to each bedroom, and delayed light switches that would allow you to turn off the light and get to your bed before it got dark. Conrad continued construction on the house until it was no longer financially feasible, and eventually he sold the home and property in 1963. The new owner subdivided the land and put the house back on the market. It was then purchased in 1964, uh, making the, uh, the family that purchased it the first actual residence of the Wonder Home. And while it was a private residence, they decided to open it up for tours uh, once again, uh, particularly in the winter when they decorated for Christmas. The basement was turned into Santa's workshop, and the front porch held a Christmas sale. Um, in 2002, the house was sold to a man named Chuck Hyden. Uh, he was 78, and he was determined to restore the house to its original intention. Um, Chuck's son, who's also named, his name was also Conrad, said that they reminded him a lot of his father's determination. Unfortunately, um, the, the new owner, he never finished the project, and uh, it passed through several hands over the years. Uh, despite each subsequent owner having ambitions to restore the house, it often became abandoned um, because there was no money to renovate or maintain. Um, it was a big disappointment to neighbors who remembered what it was like and um, were disappointed it became an eyesore in the community. In uh, 2015, the Wonder House was purchased by a man named Drew Davis, who has worked to renovate the house and bring it back to life. Before he purchased the house, it had sat abandoned for five years uh, with no electricity or running water. But now, the home is once again open to pr as a private residence and available for limited tours, uh, including Christmas, which honors the intention of the Ducharme family from the 1960s. If you've ever seen the show Amazing Interiors on Netflix, uh, The Wonder House was featured several years ago and described as a magical, mystical place. The current owners are using revenue from the tours to fund their restoration efforts. Uh, the new owners, they aim to follow Conrad Shuck's original vision for the house and revive its former charm that brought so many people to its wondrous doors. So if you've never been, uh, you should head on over to Bartow and check it out.
Our next topic is on the founding of, of Southern Casadega Spiritualist Camp over in Volusia County, just outside of the land. Now, Casadega, uh, for those of you who have heard of it, may conjure particular images of hauntings, witchcraft, and walls of advertising for psychic readings. But beyond the sensationalism is a spiritualist community uh, that has been recognized as the Southeast's oldest active religious community and has been deemed a historic place by the National Register of Historic Places. It has also been called the psychic capital of the world, a title given for several reasons, one of which lies in its founding. But before we jump into that, it's important to first understand the basics of the religion of spiritualism. After all, it is the reason for Casadega's founding, growth, and continued existence today. So modern spiritualism began in the 1800s and the core beliefs can be seen uh, on this document uh, as the Declaration of Principles according to the National Spiritualist Association of Churches. The principle I want to highlight, um, numbers four and five, come up often in discussions of Casadega. Death is a change of state of being rather than an end. Those who have moved into that state can still be communicated with. These, these two parts in particular um, made acceptance by the holy Protestant Christian beliefs around them um, very difficult. Even today, it is still misconstrued as magical, and sometimes spiritualism is misinterpreted as Wicca, eclectic, witchcraft, or even Satanism. So now that we understand a little bit about what spiritualism is about and what the beliefs are and aren't, um, let's meet the spiritualist founder of Casadega, Mr. George P. Colby. Colby was born in Pike, New York in 1848 to Baptist parents. His road to spiritualism began at the age of 12 when he was baptized. Some sources dramatize this event in varying ways, so it is difficult to say what details of it are true. The most common is the baptismal waters were so cold that they awakened his psychic abilities. As an adult, Colby became a medium, a healer, and a lecturer. He passed away in the latter half of 1933, and Casadega's community saw to his burial at the Lake Helen Casadega Cemetery. So let's revisit the baptism of George P. Colby, which is a key moment that leads to the founding of Casadega. One of the abilities Colby was said to be given uh, through his baptism was receiving messages. The first was from his deceased uncle who told Colby that he would be the founder of a spiritualist center in the South. In 1875, eight years after leaving behind uh, his abusive parents and their church, one of Colby's spiritual guides named Seneca gave him a message to seek out a medium, a man in Wisconsin named Theodore D. Giddings. Following Seneca's guidance, Colby traveled with the Giddings family until they reached unsettled woodlands in central Florida. It was here that Colby and the Giddings settled. In 1884, Colby was granted 75 acres of land from a homestead claim, and he called it the, uh, Casadega, named after a village in New York called Casadega. Colby then waited and wandered. In 1893, the National Spiritual and Liberal Association held a convention in, in De Leon Springs. Attendees were primarily from spiritual camps in northern states. Uh, one community from New York, called the Lilydale Assembly, was searching Florida for a winter residence. Two of their prominent mediums, Emma J. Huff and Marion Skidmore, visited Colby's land after hearing of his journey, and they found it to possess harmonious qualities and spiritual energies. Deleon Springs attempted to win their favor with promises to build an auditorium and a hotel, but Casadega was chosen instead. In 1894, the charter was signed to form the Southern Casadega Spiritualist Camp Meeting Association, and Colby donated 34 acres of his land for that purpose. So Volusia was unexpectedly welcoming to these spiritualists. Despite previously denouncing spiritualism, 
as both fake and a threat to Christian morality, an 1893 article from the Volusia County Record defended those religious beliefs and would later defend Casadega's residents from slander. One source of speculation for this and De Leon Springs' eagerness um, is potential economic benefit, which is reasonable considering the Deland News in 1909 stated, Lake Helen is reaping financial benefits from the camp and someday we hope to see Lake Casadega incorporated into the community of Lake Helen. The same article, however, also states that no, no town can boast of better, more highly respected citizens than Casadega. Other articles that year also praised Casadega for its free and open-handed hospitality, where people take care of each other as well as the camp. Another reason, in fact, for Volusia's reception could be because these spiritualists were predominantly white, Republican, and capitalists, blending easily into Volusia's mainstream. So now that Casadega was an official community, the next step was to build it. Sixty homes were constructed by 1915, and many structures from the early days still exist, in, at least in some form today. So we'll take a look at some of them. Ann Stevens was among the first of Casadega's winter residents, and she was the director of its association. Her home was built in 1895 and is still standing today as a bed and breakfast. The Casadega Hotel, uh, it has a bit of a winding history with the camp. It was built in 1901 as temporary living for people who are in the process of building their own homes, uh, as well as people who are visiting to, uh, in town to see mediums uh, or listen to lectures. In 1926, the original hotel burned down and was rebuilt throughout the next year, opening again in 1928. In 1933, the hotel became the only privately owned building in Casadega due to the association spending more money toward the camp that should have gone towards paying off construction of the hotel. It is still the only privately owned land in Casadega, with everything else still being owned by the association. The Andrew Jackson Davis Hall, named after one of the early leaders of spiritualism, was built to be an all-in-one meeting hall, library, and store. It now operates as the bookstore and welcome center. So if you've ever been to Casadega, chances are this is where your visit started. The Colby Memorial Temple was built in 1923, replacing an 1895 auditorium that was torn down due to structural issues. Today, it is primarily used for church services. Today's Casadega still honors most, uh, much of its founding history. Mostly the, the same Victorian-style homes dot the landscape, and the town is very walkable uh, with a few sidewalks on the roads. The residents still attend church services with similar structure from the old days. They still have lecturers from the spiritualist community who come around to, to speak on various subjects. And in recent years, plaques have been erected to um, uh, honor the history of the community and the notable buildings uh, which exist. Uh, public parks and meditation gardens have become calming sceneries dotting the land. It is still a community that is very steeped in its beliefs and values of spiritualism. And through this, Casadega has earned the titles of both the Southeast's oldest active religious community and the psychic capital of the world. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Nicolette Valdez for her presentation on Islands of Adventure. Hello, so I'm Nicolette Valdez, and I am one of the One Orlando registrars. So we're gonna go through a little bit of theme park history, specifically Islands of Adventure, and a little area of Islands of Adventure called Lost Continent. So this is an image of the theme park when it first opened in 1999, just to give a little overview. So the area that we're gonna focus on is right when guests enter the park, they will go ahead and make their way to the right, past Seuss Landing, cross over a bridge, and see a statue of a griffin. That will be the entrance of the Lost Continent. 
So Islands of Adventure was created to compete with Disney and show guests that Universal was more than backstages and studio lots. It opened on May 28, 1999, and a main highlight of the park was the Lost Continent. It's the only original land in the park and was inspired by Greek mythology, King Arthur, and the Middle East. The land featured technological advancements, live actors, stunts, and immersive scenery, and the land took travelers through the Lost City, Sinbad Bazaar, and Merlinwood. When guests enter the park, one of the first things that they come across is Miffles. Miffles is a restaurant that is themed as a grotto with Greek mythology references and figures such as Zeus, Siren, and Atlas, like the picture on the left. The theme park features American, Asian, and Mediterranean food that has also been voted as a top theme park restaurant for over 10 years. On the right-hand side is Poseidon's Fury. Poseidon's Fury features a facade of a ruinous Atlantis and features an 80-foot trident. The ride itself is a walkthrough show that guests go through an archaeological expedition and they witness the battle between Lord Darkanon and Poseidon. The main draw to that walkthrough area is a water tunnel which draws guests further into Atlantis and was the first of its kind that was in a theme park. Fun fact about the ride is that it's gone through a few iterations and the original concept plan was for Poseidon to be the bad guy and chase guests through the ride and be a dark ride where you kind of had to escape and they decided to get rid of that one. <laughs> so when you come out, you go ahead and you go through Sinbad's Bazaar. Sinbad's Bazaar is right before the area of Merlinwood and the area was themed after 1001 Nights and featured different types of stores. Uh, you could go ahead and get your fortune read, go ahead and get henna done, uh, go through a medieval mint where you created your own jewelry and witness magic. There was also a magical fountain that interacted and replied to guests in live time. And the fountain itself is a little bit of a trickster who would like to get guests close to it so it could go ahead and splash them with water. So obviously this area was very fun for kids. After that is the Eighth Forge of Sinbad. The Eighth Forge of Sinbad is a stunt show where guests entered an Arabian-themed amphitheater and witnessed Sinbad's adventure with his friend Kebab to rescue a princess from the evil witch Miseria. The show itself was really cool and featured pyrotechnics, live action fighting, water effects, and zip lining. The show is now closed, but a fun fact is that Sinbad, the comedian himself, attended opening day. Into the Merlinwood area of the park is the Enchanted Oak Tavern, which had some really good food. So it shows also Universal and Islands of Adventure's great thought to theming of the area. As you can see, this giant oak is in the image of Merlin himself. Located in front of Dueling Dragons, the area offered pub fare and barbecue food. It was themed after Merlin and his studies where guests were able to interact with him and other mythological features. And one of the main draws was the stained glass ceiling on the right hand side that showed kind of his studies and sky. Now the kids attraction for the area was the flying unicorn. The flying unicorn is part of the lost continent and also part of the Maryland wood area. The story goes that a wizard discovered a unicorn horn and used this magic to create a flying unicorn out of armor, leftover armor that could fly over the enchanted forest. Guests would enter through the forest and travel through the wizard's hut where he could see all the myth mystical creatures that interacted with the guests before you went on your adventure. One of the main draws to the area itself was dueling dragons. Dueling Dragons was Orlando's first inverted dueling coaster and was a major draw to the park because of its famous loop. Guests would go through the loop at the same time with only 18 inches of space between them. So, you know, if you're very tall, you might touch a little bit. The guests traveled through a queue that was half a mile and toured through a ruined castle due to an angel battle between the fire and ice dragon. Each track and dragon had a different track with speeds, turns, and features. So you kind of pick which one you would like more. The re-theme of the Merlin Woods side of the Lost Continent began in 2007 due to the loss of popularity and the want to bring Harry Potter and its franchise to the park. The Lost Unicorn was closed in 2008 and is now called the Flight of the Hippogriff, while the Enchanted Turn Oak Tavern is now the Three Broomsticks. Kind of features the same food, but kind of also brings some British food to the area. 
The Dueling Dragon ride was rethemed into the Dragon Challenge in 2010. The dragons were removed and the facade was changed to feature the movie Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, which featured different types of movie memorabilia throughout the queue. The dragon tracks were also changed and renamed into the Chinese Fireball or the Hungarian Horntail. The coaster also started to dispatch separately because of a few injuries that were reported when the coaster was in its dueling dragon phase. And then in 2017, the, the Dragon Challenge ride was closed due to slowing popularity and a rumor of the track itself sinking. So Islands of Adventure decided to bring in Hagrid's Motor Car Adventure, which opened in 2019 and features a new track theme and a two-person sidecar. And it's also one of the most popular rides in the park now. So what is the future? So the main areas in the Lost Continent are the Bazaar, Miffles, the Fountain, and Poseidon's Fury. There have been rumors throughout the years of the land being replaced with either more Harry Potter, Legend of Zelda, or another fantasy-themed area. Poseidon's Fury itself was closed during COVID for a little bit over two years and was used to store costumes. And public opinion at the time was that, well, they're going to announce that the Lost Continent itself is closed, but it reopened in 2002. The Lost Continent still gets plenty of traffic and a seasonal themed shop was opened in place of the Magic Shop and it's still a popular lo location for guests to travel through. All right, so that is all. And I am going to go ahead and welcome my coworker, Emily, who's gonna talk about Bach Tower. Sorry, I'm short, so hopefully this is a little more helpful. All right, so as Nicolette said, I'm Emily. I'm the uh, collections manager here at the History Center, and I am here to talk to you today a little bit about Lee Oscar Laurie and his contributions to Bach Tower Garden's Singing Tower. So, Lee Oscar Laurie is a world-renowned sculptor, mostly worked with stone. Um, he was born on October 16, 1877 in Rixdorf, Germany, and then passed away at the age of 85 on January 23, 1963 in Easton, Maryland. Um, as an infant, his family came to the United States and settled in Chicago. It was here that he fell in love with sculpture. At the age of 14, he started working with Richard Henry Park, and while working with Park, he did some of the sculptures for the White City for the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. Um, from there, Laurie went on to Yale University where he received his bachelor's degree in fine arts, later would get an honorary master's from them, and taught at the school for several years up until 1912, when he kind of decided to go out on his own and create his own path. Um, beyond this, he received eight national architectural and sculptural awards and was recognized as one of America's foremost stone sculptors. But among these accolades was Bach Tower's singing tower. Um, and we do have some historical photos, Lee Laurie. And then this is actually a photo from Bach of um, Lee Laurie with his assistant's wife, Winifred, and then Horace Burel, who was one of the stonemasons who did a lot of the photography and cataloging of the construction and Horace's wife, Stephanie. So, a little bit of history on the Singing Tower. So originally, when Bach Tower Gardens was started by Edward Bach, um, it was named the Mountain Lake Sanctuary um, and was mostly referred to as Bach's Americanization of his heritage. He was from the Netherlands. Um, in 1926, Bach determined that the perfect addition to his wild, well, bird and plant sanctuary would be a Carillion Tower, similar, basically a bell tower, similar to what you would hear throughout Europe, um, which is something that he grew up with. Uh, during this time, world-renowned landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted was working on the gardens, and this was an ongoing project, so he figured, why not bring in other well-known people to make this happen? For this, he enlisted fellow Philadelphian Mil Milton Madari, who turned around in 1927 and gave Lee Laurie a call to design the sculpture for the tower. And according to Laurie, uh, since the singing tower is in a bird and plant sanctuary, the scheme of the sculpture was mostly of birds and plants. 
He was also thrilled to find out when Madari told him that all of the sculpture would be done of Georgia marble, which is this gorgeous, veiny, kind of pink marble. Um, and he, as a stone sculptor, knew how to work with that. So he was very excited at the possibility and the prospects that that would have for the sculptures that he was creating. One of these is a special decorative band. If you look at the tower, when you look up about 32 feet above you, there is this band that encircles the entire tower. Um, for this, he thought it was important to use a lot of Florida birds, such as pelicans, there's flamingos that would be at Bach Tower, herons, geese, and swans. Um, this group of raptors, as you can see in some of the illustrations, were put together as though um, inspired, I should say, by Aesop's fables. Um, and up here is actually one of Laurie's original drawings um, that he created. And then you can see some of the maquette sketchups for what they would actually look like before going ahead and carving them in the marble. Another thing that he was responsible for were the window grills. So when you enter the tower, there are, there's an east window and a west window. And over these windows are these gorgeous inlaid window grills. Um, as you can see, one has a figure of a young man feeding flamingos and other birds um, and surrounded by elaborate foliage. Um, but essentially, these two things depict the care that goes into the sanctuary. Um, and on the other one, you can see a young man He's kind of hidden there in the center, watering the plants and caring for the foliage throughout the gardens. And Lee Laurie has written, um, the stone used is an important factor in the success of architectural sculpture. An excellent design can, be, can lose its character for vigorous design its force if the material will not allow a brilliant interpretation. So back to, he likes to harp on um, how exciting it was to use Georgia marble. As we move up the tower, um, it starts to go into more of an octagon shape. On the finials of this octagon shape are eagles, which you can see up here in the corner. These are some of the maquettes for the eagles that he created. And as well, when you get all the way up to the top of the tower, there are 14-foot herons that look down on you as you circle the tower. Um, we have an example of those over here. They do go back and forth between a male heron with a fish in his mouth and a female heron who is with a nest of young. And unfortunately, during the construction of all of this, it is Florida, accidents happen, uh, one of the herons was struck by lightning. So you can see right here the destruction that was done. Um, and originally, when these were created, they were sculpted out of a single block of marble. Um, they weren't done in pieces. So they kind of drew in what's missing. And then over here is two of the stonemasons and carvers basically just replacing the head. They were trying to take it up to the top of the tower so that it could be placed over what was destroyed. Now we're going to go all the way back down to the bottom of the tower. And um, I don't know how many of you have been there and seen it. There is a sundial on the south side. Now, for the sundial is a gnomon, which is in the shape of a serpent. And below this is a chronological carving that allows you to figure out the time down to the exact second. Um, when the sun is in the right spot, and you can see there's a close-up of what the serpent looks like, and then here's a photo of it in place. Um, surrounding this are depictions of the zodiac symbols. So one of my favorite things about this is that Lee Laurie is the one who drew and designed the zodiac symbols, but his trusty assistant and sculptor in his own right, Robert C. Wakeman, was the one who actually came down to Florida, supervised everything, and carved those himself for the singing tower. So he had a, quite a bit of a contribution as well. Once you go inside, it is this huge vaulted room, which ended up becoming Edward, one of Edward Bach's favorite places on the property. And what we're going to focus on is this fireplace. So Lori helped with the design of the fireplace with all of the um, adornments. And you can see above the fireplace, we have a close-up of the maquette. And this scene was, let's see, um, it depicts Florida showing the singing tower in the center. 
St. Augustine, a few of the other cities that are older in the state, as well as an alligator, which kind of a must, a galleon, and um, in the Gulf, a figure of the wind blowing in, and Neptune riding in on his seahorses. And then if you look down a little bit more, right here, right above the actual fireplace on the hood, uh, you can see in the center is a big bell because it's a bell tower. Um, and on either side are two men who are ringing the bells and just past them are the crowds of people who have come to listen. And it kind of brings the entire thing full circle. Um, I will say this tower is still an awe-inspiring feature of Bach Tower Gardens. So if you haven't been, I have not, head down there. Um, and as I mentioned before, Mr. Bach saw the tower as a sanctuary, and he saw it as a gift to the American people. Um, so he kind of summed the entire thing up to what he called the dream team of architects, designers, by saying, make your world a bit better and more beautiful because you have lived in it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Whitney for her presentation on Orlando and the Ch excuse me, Chitlin Circuit. Hello, um, my name is Whitney Barrett. I'm the archivist here at the History Center, and I will be talking about music in Orlando as well as a venue in Orlando that was a part of the Chitlin Circuit. Um, so although you might not think of Orlando as being a popular music destination, many of the great singers of jazz, blues, and gospel music pass through here. Big names such as Ray Charles, B.B. King, and Ella Fitzgerald, just to name a few. Um, all made stops here on their way to becoming successful artists. Now some of the black singers, like the ones I just mentioned, um, got their start and rose to fame during the Jim Crow era. This was a time when segregation was legal and it touched about every aspect of life in the United States. The color line was not only drawn in restaurants, um, but also schools, hotels, bathrooms, and water fountains. The list was endless. It even extended into the world of entertainment. Although black artists were certainly talented enough to perform in the same venues as their white counterparts, many were not extended that chance. However, this did not stop the music. This led to the creation of what is now commonly referred to as the Chitlin Circuit. This was a network of mostly black owned venues concentrated in the South, where many now famous black musicians performed during the Jim Crow era. According to author Preston Lauterbach, it was also referred to as the one-nighter circuit or the theatrical circuit. Although the origin of the term Chitlin Circuit can be debated, one theory cites that this is because these venues often included chitlins on their menu, along with other soul food dishes. Also, some artists say that a plate of chitlins would be included as part of their pay for their performance. So during its heyday from the 1920s through the 1960s, the South Street Casino was a staple in the black community in Orlando. Located at 519 West South Street, it was owned and operated by Dr. William Monroe Wells, one of Orlando's first black physicians. He also owned the Wells-built hotel right next door, one of the few places in Orlando where black visitors could stay. The Dr. Wells Casino does not refer to a place um, for gambling, but a place where social events could be held. The South Street Casino was more of a community center that hosted events such as neighborhood dances, meetings, weddings, birthday parties, and even boxing matches. At one point, there was even a basketball court and a skating rink inside the building. As time went on, it became a popular stop for up-and-coming black musicians touring the music circuit in Central Florida. Although it couldn't compare to the Apollo Theater in Harlem or the Royal Peacock in Atlanta, in Orlando, the South Street Casino was the place to perform. As time went on, the quarterback club began to operate inside the South Street Casino. This was a private bottle club, meaning members would bring their own bottles um, of alcohol to drink instead of buying beverages from a bartender. The club once met inside the Wells-built hotel. However, after Dr. Wells' passing in 1957, the club began to operate inside the casino. The club continued to hold adult dances and musical performances as part of the Chitlin Circuit. One ad in the Orlando Sentinel from 1962 reads, the quarterback club of Orlando presents Count Basie and his orchestra at the South Street Casino. As the casino continued to evolve, so did its name. Unfortunately, the building suffered fire damage in, I'm sorry, so does its name. Eventually, the building was regularly referred to as 
simply the quarterback club. Unfortunately, the building suffered fire damage in the 1980s and it was torn down, so you can no longer go by and see it. Um, but even though it's still gone, it's still remembered as once being a vital part of Orlando's black community. So when traveling the circuit in the south, securing the necessary sleeping accommodations was just as important as booking the performance. Being on the road wasn't always fun. Um, racism was real and being black in the south in an unfamiliar area could be, be, ver to be very dangerous. The Negro Motorist Green Book was first published in 1936. This was a guidebook that black travelers used to locate hotels, restaurants, um, and other places that would cater to them. Although author Victor H. Green's first edition of the guide focused on New York City, it was soon expanded to cover other states. And in, 1956, um, in the 1956 edition of the guide, there were two hotels listed, the Wells Built Hotel and the Sun Glow Motel. The Sun Glow Highway Hotel was located at 737 South Orange Blossom Trail across the street from Jones High School. It was first opened around 1955 with an apartment addition added on the following year. And its motto was, a highway hotel catering to the elite colored clientele. And this is a brochure that we have in our collection here that you can see on the screen. As you can see by these hotel receipts, many famous performers stayed here as well. However, unlike the Wells Built Hotel, this establishment was white owned and operated. Franklin James Manuel, owner of the construction company Manuel Builders Inc., ran the hotel until about 1970. The building is still standing and currently known as the Orange Inn Motel. And you can see um, some of the names on the, rece the receipts are B.B. King, Little Richard, um, Mr. and Mrs. Ray Charles, and Mahalia Jackson. So eventually, um, black performers were allowed on stage in other venues in Orlando, but unfortunately, um, Jim Crow was still um, in effect, so the audience was segregated. In 1957, Louis Armstrong performed at the Orlando Municipal Auditorium, which is now known as the Bob Carr Center, and the Orlando Sentinel ad noted that there was a reserved section for white and colored. Still, two years later, another Sentinel ad from June 1959 for a Mahalia Jackson concert held at the Orlando Municipal Auditorium, again noted segregated seating. If you look at the photo of Mahalia Jackson on the screen, you might be able to see a sign um, in the top right corner. There's an advertisement promoting her upcoming performance. And that picture was taken at Gale's department store here in Orlando. So after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, um, it ended the segregation uh, in public spaces. So you can see um, up here Duke Ellington performing in 1971 at the Orlando Municipal Auditorium. And then here you have B.B. King and Ray Charles also performing B.B. Um, King in 1990 and Ray Charles in 1978. So with the passage of the Civil Rights Act, this not only allowed for more opportunities for um, artists to perform, but also for black people to attend more performances. With public spaces become generally more integrated, the need to seek out black-only spaces and spaces to sleep and perform waned away. Although many of the clubs and venues that artists performed at are no longer around, the influences of the musical talent that walk through the doors can still be heard today. And with that, I will pass it off to Aaron Paul. So I am the digital archivist here at the History Center, and I'm going to be talking about Lake Apopka's transformation from a fantastic, uh, nationally known fishing spot to a very polluted place to now a nice nature area. Um, but a while ago, uh, in the 20s and 30s, it was considered to be one of the best fishing spots in Florida and attracted people from all over to its waters. Uh, it is the fourth largest lake in Florida and connects to the St. John's River through some canals and other lakes. But in the 1930s, the fishing was so good at the time that it could support 29 different fish camps around the perimeter of the lake, uh, taking people out on tours and uh, guide boats and it was still hard to find a boat, even with all of those camps. Um, Could a fisherman expect to bring home after a 
few hours fishing out here on this lake? Well, if you wanted to bring them all home, uh, you could bring a hundred bass home easily in a half a day fishing. Clint? So, there was some pretty great fishing there. Um, I don't know anywhere else you can go now and get a hundred fish in an hour or a day besides one of those concrete places where they just dunk a uh, rod in and pull up as many as you want. But uh, in 1941, they built a levee to drain 20,000 acres of marshland uh, around the lake and transform it into muck farms, which just pretty much takes the uh, nutrient-rich land around a lake and turns it into really productive farmland. And so the way they did that, they didn't have any type of barrier or anything separating the water from the farmland, and it led to uh, really high amounts of nutrients, phosphorus, and uh, pollutants going straight into the lake off of those farms and fields and led to a chronic algae bloom. The changes to the environment ended up kind of decimating the uh, game fish population in the lake. And by 1985, there were no more fish camps on, uh, around Lake Apopka. Uh, With our expanding population, the lake has become one of the Southeast's worst polluted freshwater bodies through carelessness, negligence, and abandoned concern for nature. So in addition to all of the phosphorus and fertilizer and other runoff, there was also a ton of pesticides that were ending up in the lake. And it got so bad that in 1965, they had to stop commercial catfishing because the levels of DDT were too high to be legally uh, sold. Um, and I think most of us are probably familiar with DDT and its effect on uh, eagle or bald eagle eggs. and that it's a banned uh, chemical because of how harmful it was to the environment. Um, in addition to that, in 1980, a local pesticides manufacturer called Tower Chemical Company was improperly dumping uh, chemicals, and a lot of those ended up in Lake Apopka. The site was then designated a Superfund cleanup site by the EPA, which allows for additional funding uh, from the government to clean up sites that are so bad that they're you know, harmful for people to even walk into. Uh, and it's been getting cleaned up since then uh, and might still be getting cleaned up in certain areas. But because of how Lake Apopka connects to other lakes and the St. Johns River, that Pollutant, those toxins have also spread farther than just Lake Apopka. Um, all of those chemicals caused health problems and deaths with, within the native wildlife, uh, including high levels of infertility among the alligator population. Um, and this is one of the owners of the last, one of the last remaining fish camps on Lake Apopka. Hey, no, Fred, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my foot down here. I'm afraid gangrene to sit in. Sorry, looking in the water. Uh, I hate to see it. So, uh, all the pollution decimated the economic potential of this area, and people who grew up there, lived there their whole lives, were afraid to go in the water for very valid reasons. Uh, it got so bad that the health department put up signs and recommended that no one enter the water at all, let alone fish or eat anything coming out of the water. Uh, and here are what the muck farms look like. You can see that, uh, at least in some areas, the muck farms go up pretty much right to the edge of the lake. And so there's no, um, nothing stopping runoff from those farms going straight into the water. And with all the pesticides and fertilizers, fer fertilizer used, uh, that was all just running off straight into the lake. Um, these farms were really productive and so they usually have three rounds of planting a year. 
uh, which meant, again, lots of pesticides and fertilizer going in to maintain that high level of production. With all of that runoff, uh, the water quality continued to decline. And it's a little harder to see with black and white photos, but it really significantly affected the conditions in the lake. Uh, it also kind of destroyed the plant diversity uh, at the lake and replaced the wide variety of different species that were native to the area with primarily hyacinth. Um, and that plant extended out from the shore uh, all the way. You can see the boat launches and one of the fish camps, and you can see how far the hyacinth has covered up. Those would all be places where you could launch a boat. Uh, and so you can see how, how much it, it's expanded. It also expanded into the Apopka Buclair Lock and Canal that ultimately leads to the St. John's River. And uh, on top of all the damage to the plant life and pollution affecting the water quality, it also really affected the uh, native animal population at Lake Apopka. Uh, alligators and turtles died or had reproductive issues. And between November of 1998 and April of 1999, over 670 birds died from eating contaminated fish. Uh, including a ton of white pelicans, which that is a huge amount of birds to die in such a short time in such a small area. Uh, we actually have an oral history with someone who was part of the rescue rehabilitation efforts with those uh, birds, and most of them did not survive, even with rehabilitators helping to uh, try to bring them back up to health and flush those toxins from their systems. In addition to the uh, native plants and animals, the fish, uh, especially the bass and the game fish, died off uh, and got replaced by another species called gizzard shad, which is a species that is way more acclimated to high uh, phosphorus conditions and actually accumulates a lot of phosphorus in its tissue. Um, and so, you would think that would help reduce phosphorus levels in the lake, but it actually compounds the problem. Uh, when the gizzard shad die, that phosphorus gets released back into the lake instead of moving through kind of the rest of the waterway and filtering out. It just kind of cycles and increases the phosphorus levels over time. Uh, so the friends of Lake Apopka was established in 1991 to try to start cleaning up the lake and make it a more habitable, nice place to visit uh, and stop the flow of phosphorus, which uh, about 85% of the phosphorus was coming from directly from the muck farms on the north shore, north shore of the lake. In 1996, Governor Lawton Childs signed the Lake Apopka Restoration Act and spent a, over $100 million purchasing land around the lake, uh, the farmland, the muck farms, to uh, shut them down and return them to um, marshland, which helps bring back the uh, plant diversity the animal diversity and helps filter the water as it's coming off of the farmland so it can slowly work its way through the marsh, get cleaned um, as it goes through that stage. And then by the time it gets to the lake, it's much cleaner and healthier for the uh, animals that live in the lake. Um, as part of that restoration effort, the soil around the lake uh, was turned over uh, pretty deeply. They dug down pretty deep, turned it over to br switch the polluted soil on top with unpolluted soil underneath and help speed up that process. But the turning over of soil process wasn't completed until 2009. 
Uh, since they started these efforts, they've removed over 8,400 metric tons or 18.5 million pounds of gizzard shad from the lake to directly remove that phosphorus uh, from the environment uh, that was stored in all the fish. And that 8,400 metric tons of fish equals about 58 metric tons of phosphorus. In 2014, the Lake Apopka Loop Trail opened to the public and is supposedly very nice. Uh, it's about, a, I think it's a couple hour trip around the lake where you can see all of the wildlife that has started to come back. Uh, you can see a lot of the diversity and a lot of the plants that have changed and make it, made it a much nicer place. But the cleanup efforts are still in progress and it wasn't until 2022 that the phosphorus levels finally came under the target level. So this is still very much uh, a cleanup in progress, um, but it is much better than it was before. And with that, I'd like to pass it off to Jeremy to talk about the SST Museum. Hello, how's it going everyone? Hello, uh, my name is Jeremy Heilman. I am the assistant curator here in the collections department at the History Center. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a defunct tourist attraction uh, in Kissimmee, Florida, uh, part of Osceola County that lasted from 1973 until 1981. That had a pretty interesting history. So um, what you see here on the screen is an artist's rendering of a Boeing aircraft. Uh, it was supposed to be the supersonic transport, um, which was a passenger plane that was developed uh, in the United States to go faster than the speed of sound. Um, the first ever uh, supersonic flight took place in 1947. Um, and from that point, um, there was a lot of military application of that, but also the hopes that there could be like an actual passenger plane developed um, using that technology that would go that fast. Um, so as early as the 1950s, Boeing began working on uh, this project in hopes that that would eventually come to fruition. Um, and of course, other manufacturers in different countries around the world also hope to um, utilize that technology for you know, commercial usage. Uh, in the early 1960s, uh, here in the United States, several leading aircraft manufacturers um, received a request for a proposal um, for uh, the SST project from the FAA, um, and the submissions of those companies were turned in in 1964, um, and Boeing was announced as the winner um, in January of 1967. So uh, what you see is this plane, uh, this mock-up of the plane in Boeing's headquarters in Seattle at that time. Um, the, uh, the community in Seattle also had another kind of significant thing happening at this point. Um, they were awarded an, an NBA franchise at the end of 1966 that would begin play um, for the 1967-1968 season. Um, and the team was actually named for this project, the supersonic airplane. Um, and the original logo actually had a plane on it that was the Seattle Supersonics, um, who are no longer a team in the NBA, but at, for many years were um, kind of a staple of the Seattle community. Um, the uh, mock-up version of the plane you see here, this is the Boeing 2707, um, and you see some statistics there. On the left side are sort of the, the physical makeup of the actual um, mock-up plane that existed at that time. It was 288 feet long, um, 50 feet high, counting that back wing there, and then the wingspan was just over 141 feet. And then on the right side you see some Theoretical statistics, uh, the cruising speed was 1,800 miles an hour, which is very fast. Um, that's about three times the average, just like commercial airline flight um, speed and a, a passenger capacity of 350. Um, and I say this as a theoretical concept because um, this never became a real actual airplane. So the physical mock-up existed, but it was never developed fully into a usable airplane. Um, the idea of traveling so quickly certainly had that appeal, but the issue uh, among many were uh, environmental concerns. Um, this type of technology would really 
damage the ozone layer, which is obviously not great. And then um, there were uh, concerns of noise because if you're going at supersonic speeds, that's when you get the sonic booms. So if this was to travel, say, from Los Angeles to New York, you would be hearing that kind of the entire way through over the land. So that's why um, the couple of, uh, of planes that were developed that could do this technology, which was the the two 144 in the Soviet Union and the Concorde, which is a, you know, a fairly well-known thing to this day that existed for many years. The, the Concorde was um, a transatlantic route, so you weren't kind of getting that disturbance over land as it was flying at those speeds. Um, so there was never an American counterpoint that was developed to that plane. And basically, um, this, uh, this mock-up went unused. Um, cost uh, $10.8 million to develop. Um, and at the end of the project, once it was canceled, um, lacking uh, you know, congressional support, um, it was purchased by Marks Morrison and Don Otis, who decided to build a museum uh, to house the plane mock-up, and that's where the Central Florida element of this comes in. So those two paid uh, $31,000 to purchase the plane and then paid $34,000 to transfer it all the way, to, to transport it all the way to Kissimmee. Um, it cost almost $40,000 to put it back together once they got it here, and then um, they built a facility around it that cost uh, about $250,000. So all in, you're looking at more than $350,000 to create this museum. Um, the SST was transported from Seattle to Kissimmee um, in early 1973, and it was done via train. So the plane was actually cut up into five sections. Um, four of them arrived in Kissimmee, one did not. Um, it got lost, so uh, they eventually found it. It turned up, so that's good. Um, so the location of the museum, which you can see kind of on the map there, um, was just off the Kissimmee exit of the Turnpike on uh, 192. Um, and with a lot of attractions kind of in this era in the early 70s, all well into the 80s, there was um, you know an appeal of putting something that would appeal to tourists, perhaps, um, just because of the, the newly opened Walt Disney World. Um, the plane itself, they actually put a, uh, like a concrete slab down, put the plane on it, and then built a steel building around it. So that's how the actual museum was built um, because of the fact that um, even with such a large building, they had to remove certain portions of the plane so it could fit. So it was a massive building, but um, you know, even with that, they couldn't fit it all in. So we have um, some brochures from the museum here in our collection, so um, kind of a cool little uh, thing to look back on. Uh, it opened in July of 1973, um, and aside from the SST plane, there were some other uh, aircraft, um, things from World War I and World War II. There was also the world's largest display of aircraft models. Um, there was a, um, a vintage car collection as well, so there were some Ferraris and other kind of rare and expensive cars on display. Uh, in the early years, uh, they got um, on some popular days between four and five hundred people. So it was a success, kind of in those those early times. Um, and then, uh, you know, throughout the 70s and 80s, a lot of other attractions opened, um, and you know, similar type things uh, that you know opened and closed. And I think that that's sort of a common story with with a lot of these kind of smaller tourist attractions. So the SST Museum was only opened um, just shy of eight years. So the owner, Marks Mortensen, um, cited a couple reasons why it didn't really work out for them. Um, he had originally planned to have more financial supporters and that didn't really pan out. And then he also felt that he didn't really get the support from the community that he had expected. Um, so it did not last. Um, I also imagine as time went on, the idea of what the SST was kind of lost a little bit significance. So, um, you know, it just didn't make it. And then it closed on June 26th of 1981. Um, and the next day, they started auctioning off pieces of the museum, but they actually um, were not able to auction off the SST. There wasn't, you know, interest for the, the price that they were asking. So the building was purchased by Faith World Church in 1983 for $250,000. Um, the church obviously wouldn't have much use for the airplane, but because it was so expensive and kind of prohibitive to take it out of the building, they just did their church services under the airplane. Um, 
So uh, that lasted for a while. By the late 1980s, another church actually took over the building, the Osceola New Life Assembly of God, um, and they are the ones that have called that building home ever since. Uh, the plane stayed in the building until 1990, um, until it was sold to Charles Bell, who was an aircraft restorer in Merritt Island. So they cut it up again, took it out of there, and then uh, you know it went to Merritt Island. Then it was sold to Stanley Hiller, who was the founder of the Hiller Aviation Museum in California, um, and it was actually on display there until 2013. Um, and then the Seattle Museum of Flight uh, took possession. The plane itself is not actually on display in the museum proper, but it is in their restoration center, or at least portions of it are. So if you take one of their like behind the scenes tours, you can still see portions of, uh, of that plane. And then um, as it pertains to what is currently here, the building that the, uh, the museum was in is still there. Um, that church is now known as the Life Church, um, and it's the same entity that had purchased it in 1988. Um, over time, the church made upgrades to the building. Um, and aside from the kind of unusual shape, which you see here, this is a recent picture of the, uh, the church. They've upgraded it so much that you would really never know that the plane was in there and it wasn't just kind of a, a regular building. So like a lot of uh, attractions in this era, area, um, it's a, a bygone thing um, and you wouldn't necessarily know that it was there unless you were around at that time or had looked into it. But um, another reason why we're you know, kind of highlighting these things today is things you might not know about. All of us are part of the collections department here at the History Center, so that would be kind of the arm of the museum that collects and preserves the, the artifacts, the photos, the recordings, all that kind of thing. So yeah, we are, are all employees here at the History Center. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. That's very nice of you. Oh, we do. I will let you know about those here in just a minute. Yeah. So cool. Anybody else? Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.